So a firm foundation, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Standing on that firm foundation, being stable, unshaken in our walk with the Lord. And so let's continue today by looking at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, I want to read verses 12 to 18. Philippians 1, 12 to 18. Which says, I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. It's really an amazing uh, passage right there. The Apostle Paul, he's in prison in Rome as he writes this letter. He's been unfairly treated. He's had a, a lot of rough uh, experiences, so he's encountering difficult circumstances. And as you can see, he's also looking at dealing with difficult people, people giving him a hard time. And so that's the circumstance that he's in. And, and I think that just uh, highlights something that stable saints are hard to find. People like this, they're hard to find. In fact, that stable saints, that probably would have been a better title. Huh? Characteristics of a stable saint. Don't you like the sound of that? Anyways, uh, it, they're hard to find because especially nowadays, it seems like so many seem to be blown about by all the winds of circumstances and emotions and false teaching. It shouldn't be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. That's why we're doing this study to encourage one another to be more like a spiritual thermostat than a spiritual thermometer. And so in lesson one, we talked about the priority, which is the word of God, and we looked at Psalm 119. And that just highlights the fact that if you don't know your Bible, you're going to have a hard time really standing firm. And if you don't really know what the Bible teaches, you're going to have a hard time. And uh, I'll just tell you this, you, you may not know the Bible as well as you think you do. When was the last time you had a test on your Bible knowledge? Maybe that's what I'll do next week. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a little test of your basic Bible knowledge, see, see how you're doing. Uh, that, that's a big part of it. The person who wrote Psalm 119, you, you could tell that they had totally submitted themselves to the absolute authority of God's word. And they had complete confidence in the sufficiency of God's word to help them no matter how hard things are in this life. And, and it's kind of summed up near the end of that psalm in verse 165. Psalm 119, 165 says this, Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I, I think we'd all like to have great peace and not stumble. Well, that's what ha happens to people who really love God's law. So that was lesson one. Lesson two we we'll talked about the purpose. The, the stable Christian has a, lives with a purpose, and that purpose is the glory of God. And we talked about different ways that we glorify God throughout uh, the Scriptures, different ways that we're shown how to uh, glorify God. And, and it was all kind of summed up at the end in Psalm 16, where David uh, wrote these words, Psalm 16, uh, verses 8 and 9, he says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells 
secure. Because he had set the Lord always before him. It's always about the Lord. Uh, I'm living for him. I'm looking to him. I'm wanting to please and honor and glorify him. That's what it was all about. And, And those two, the priority of God's word and the purpose of God's glory, provide the rails for you to run down on a, have a stable life. And then the thing that really fuels it and keeps you going down the track is the passion that we started talking about last week. And the passion there is the gospel of God. And you can see that here in this passage that we read. Paul's all about seeing the gospel advance. And he, he, so he was able to deal with the difficult circumstances as we saw last time when we looked at verses 12 to 14 because his life wasn't about himself. His, his life was all about seeing the gospel advance. And so no, despite the difficulties of his circumstances, verse 18 he says, I rejoice. I, I rejoice which are, um, is an amazing statement considering where he is and what's going on in his life. Not, not a lot of Christians could say that, but stable Christians say that. That's what we're looking at. Today we want to talk about uh, maintaining stability and having a rejoicing heart despite difficult people. Well, last time we talked about difficult circumstances. Now we're going to talk about difficult people. So this is a strictly hypothetical type of thing. You, you, you know, you may have heard of difficult people, uh, but anyways. Uh, so we're going to be looking at verses 15 to 18 today. And just to start off with, I, I just want to say this. The key in all of this is a true humility. God gives grace to the Who? And he's opposed to the who? And when it says he gives grace, he really does give grace to the humble. And when it says he's opposed to the proud, he really is opposed to the proud. And so we want to take a look at this today. Our lives as believers have to be all about worshiping the Lord, being grateful, thankful, humble that he would do anything for me. And we're all about advancing the gospel and serving other people. Today, I want you to see how gospel joy is greater than hurt feelings. People who live to see the gospel advance, they don't get hung up on themselves. And so you gotta, you got to start with the right expectation. So I think number one on your outline there is to expect conflict. Isn't that a cheery topic to start on here this morning? You got to expect conflict. And I will tell you that one of the greatest hindrances to advancing the gospel is hurt feelings among believers. That's a big issue. Big issue. A lot of people walking around with hurt feelings, and all they want to tell you about is their hurt feelings. And those hurt feelings seem absolutely insurmountable. And when you're talking to somebody who has hurt feelings, it's really hard to reason with that person because the emotions have just taken over in their lives. So let's, let's talk about some things that can help us with that. And, and letter A, do you have this on your, on your handout? Expect conflict in the church. Is that what you came in here this morning expecting? Some, that you might have to deal with some conflict in, in the church? Well, you look at the Apostle Paul here in Philippians, and even though the gospel was advancing, that doesn't mean that it was easy for Paul. He's getting flack And he's getting it from fellow Christians. He says in verse 15, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, and here we go, thinking to afflict me. 
They are out to hurt my feelings. People in the church are, are, are doing this. It's bad enough he's suffering imprisonment uh, because of the Jewish, leaders, Jewish religious leaders who pressured the Roman government into arresting him and all that he had to suffer along the way, all the difficult circumstances he has to face. But now he's got believers piling on. And you can see here, he, he talks about envy, rivalry, selfish ambition. They are wanting to afflict Paul, it says uh, there in verse 17. They're wanting to cause him distress in his heart, would be another way to say that. And to put it in our modern terminology, they just want to hurt his feelings. And, and you can let your imagination go with what they might be saying about Paul. Um, he's washed up. We're the new guys. He, he's irrelevant. Uh, you know, all kinds of things that they might have been saying about him. I think that the deepest wounds come from false accusations from fellow believers. Uh, th those can be the greatest disappointments you, you can face in your life. Uh, it's extremely hard when Christians belittle devalue and attack your reputation trying to tear you down. And, and this kind of stuff is often aimed at leaders. Leaders in the church are often unfairly judged and criticized. And, and you need to know that that can be very discouraging to the leaders of the church. Uh, I met with the, some of the guys from the church I used to pastor in San Antonio, and uh, you know they're being accused of all kinds of things because they're dealing with some difficult situations with some people in the church. And those people that they're trying to deal with are feeling free to talk to anybody and everybody about what's going on and how badly the leaders are treating them and you know, all of this kind of stuff, saying all kinds of untrue, unfair, hurtful things about the leaders. And then when people come to the leaders, uh, the leaders aren't going to talk to them because the leaders are going to play by the rules. And you're only going to talk to the people you're supposed to talk to, not everybody and anybody. But so when they're playing by the rules and they're saying that they're not going to talk about all this stuff that the other people are saying about them, well, then the people coming to them, take that as an admission of guilt. And so there you have it. Those are the, those, that's real life. That happens. And it happens uh, in the church. That, this is an, that was an issue in the church in Philippi. Now that's the main reason Paul is writing this letter. They had lost their joy. We think of this book as the book of joy because Paul's talking about joy and rejoicing but if you have to keep commanding people to rejoice they are not rejoicing they are not a happy group that he's writing to and they have lost their joy because they become distracted from the mission of advancing the gospel and they were in conflict with one another i mean you, you see that look at chapter two starting in verse one he says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Why is he saying that? Because that's not where they are. He says in verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Uh, he's dealing with the issues that they're facing there. Look at verse 14 in chapter 2, uh, where he says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why would he even need to say that? Uh, that's what we do. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Hey, 
Stop your whining and start shining. You're not going to shine if all you're doing is whining. That's what was happening. And then uh, look at chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And, uh, you know, if, if, this tr- if this letter written to the church at Philippi, if they did what we think they probably did when they got a letter from Paul, they called the whole church together and they read the letter to the whole church, that was a bad day for two ladies in the church. Verse 2 says, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche. So who do you think everybody's looking at right at this point? I urge you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord, which means they weren't. And he says, yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. You know, these ladies used to be all about advancing the gospel. Now they're in conflict with one another. This, this happens. This happens in church. You shouldn't be surprised. You should expect it, uh, that this is what's going to happen. And why, why does it happen in churches? Pride, okay. Hurt people hurt people, okay. There's people in church. Yeah. You know, so if you think you're going to leave a church because you've got problems with some of the people there, guess what? There's people at every church. And we haven't reached full maturity yet. And so there's going to be problems. We should expect it. We should expect it. And secondly, here this will make you feel even better, expect conflict to be personal. Expect the conflict to be personal. You'll notice there in uh, Philippians 1.15, he starts off with the word some, and that refers back to verse 14, the brothers. Some of the brothers. Some of the brothers. And so these are personal attacks by some of the brothers within the church at Rome where Paul is when he writes this. And he says, some indeed, uh, you know, without a doubt, this is for sure, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Uh, so this, this is what's going on. They're, they're, they're demonstrating envy. They're acting out of envy. Maybe they're envious of Paul's achievements, of Paul's notoriety. Uh, Paul, they're seeing Paul as an enemy to their pride. Now, how, how does that look today? We don't have the Apostle Paul here, but how does envy show up in the church today? Yes, sir. Yep, that happens. What's that? Worship, we, yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, there's these parking places right out here say reserved. That was for the previous tenant of this building. That's not for us. But I had somebody chewing on my ear one day because how come, how come Gary Buckles gets to park in a reserved spot? <laughs> That's probably a question many of you have been asking. But see, they thought that was like reserved for church VIPs. It means nothing is, is what it means. They thought those were reserved spot for church. How, do, how does he get to be a VIP and I'm not one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's just a real life example to, of how, how that happens. How come this person gets that perver- preferred position or whatever? The other, What's that? He showed up early. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. He gets here early. That's, uh, the next word is rivalry. That's uh, strife, contention, conflict, 
competition. Is that common in the church? Oh, yeah. Uh, another word you could use there would be party spirit. Uh, I, I, me and my people who have our preferences want everything to be done our way at the church. We want to sing our songs. Uh, we want to hear our kind of sermons. Uh, we, want, we want our fellowship group to do what I want it to do. And if it's not happening, we're, we're going to get upset because we want the prominence. And so we'll get angry and we will resort to slander and criticism of those people who aren't on my team. That would be a good definition of a spiritually unstable condition. You're living with this party spirit and everybody's got to go the way I think we should go. But that happens. People get caught up in that. And you can think of a lot of ways. Let me just say, you don't want to be that person. You do not want to be that person. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let me just show you. The Corinthians, did they have a party spirit thing going on there? Oh, yeah. They're all lining up behind their favorite teachers and uh, you know they're having conflicts with one another. It, it's not. It's not good. And so Paul says this in chapter three, First Corinthians three, verse sixteen. He says, "Do you not know that you and the you there is plural? So it's all y'all. So this is talking to the whole church, all y'all." Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God's church, body of Christ, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. God doesn't like it when people mess with his church. You're trying to stir up trouble. You're trying to cause conflict. God, God, doesn't, uh, God doesn't like that. And God responds to that. You don't want to be that person. Now all this stuff that's going on there in Rome that Paul's writing about in Philippians 1, all, all, of the, all the things that are being said about him and to him are probably related to his imprisonment. As he says that in the end of verse 17, they're, they're thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. That's the area where they could attack him. Maybe he's in prison because he's committed some secret sin. You know, you know how, how do you respond to that? Somebody's accusing you of some secret sin, and that's why you must be where you are. Or, you know, this is some kind of chastening from the Lord on Paul's life. You know, there are people in the church who think that they can read your heart. Have you ever met one of those people? They, they think they can read your heart, and they always think the worst of you. Now, if they could read my heart, they would have a reason to think poorly of me. <laughs> But the reality is, can you read anybody's heart? No, but that happens. And uh, accusations are made, gossip gets spread, slander is employed. And Paul might have been tempted to think, this is the church? that This is what I'm giving my life for? People like this? I mean, he might have been tempted to think that way, but he didn't. And in fact, he does point out that some people respond out of love for him. So, it's, so that's another thing to remember. You might have people giving you a hard time, but they aren't everybody. There are, there are other people, true believers, acting like it, loving you, encouraging you, all those kinds of things. The other thing that he mentions there is they do it out of selfish ambition. There in verse 17, selfish ambition. 
Uh, they, they, they want to promote themselves. This Paul being locked up in prison gives me the chance to elevate myself and my ministry. He's, he's been kind of sidelined over here. Here's my chance to step up and, and take over and get some of the recognition that Paul was getting. I, I don't know. I would never want to get what Paul was getting. I, 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 don't, I don't like getting beat up. I don't like getting thrown in jail. I don't like having people throwing stones at me. I, 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 why would I want to be Paul? But that's not what they're thinking about. And that's what you should think about too when people today uh, think they want to be uh, in the position of some, some spiritual leader, some pastor who has a worldwide ministry. I, I want to be like him. No, you don't. If you knew what he had to deal with on a regular basis, you don't want to be like him. If he's a faithful pastor, faithful Bible teacher, uh, you want to appreciate him. I don't know that you'd want to be like him. You know, when I was a new Christian and I was going to a church that was growing all the time, I thought I wanted to be a pastor. And I thought, this is, this is great. You know, you just go somewhere, you start teaching the Bible, a thousand people will show up, and pretty soon you'll have a ministry all around the world. That's what, that's what I thought. But now I realize if you're a faithful pastor and you've got 100 people in your church and 51 of them think you should still be employed next week, you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, and there's one well-known uh, pastor who uh, I've heard him say this multiple times that every Sunday night he resigns. He just says, if this is the best you can do, what, what do you, what's the point? You might as well just give it up. But so far, every Monday morning, he's convinced himself, I'll try it for one more week. He's been doing that for many weeks now. And we're warned about this kind of selfish ambition. Turn over to 1 Peter. This, this is a particularly... Um, common thing amongst people in leadership or people who want to be in leadership. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter's addressing elders in the church, and he says in verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Now, when he says not for shameful gain, why, why would he say that? Would any, would any leader ever do it for shameful gain? Yeah. That's one demonstration of selfish ambition. They're in it for themselves. Okay, now verse 3. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Do you ever think that there's any leaders that are domineering? Do you? Yeah. So see, they're in it for the power, the authority. That's, that's why they're doing it. It's, it's all about themselves and promoting themselves and, and all of that. Um, in, in 3 John, John talks about a particular man he has, says, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. This guy Diotrephes was so full of himself, he loved to have the preeminent position. The Apostle John, he can't tell me what to do. And so while that may be particularly true of people in leadership positions, it happens all through the church. It's selfish ambition. I'm going to do things my way. I want to be preeminent. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. And so all of this, envy, rivalry, selfish ambition, it's all happening there in Rome. And the intent is to hurt Paul. They want to, as it says there, afflict him. 
cause him inner turmoil. They want to hurt his feelings. And like I said, that's a really common problem in the church today, hurt feelings. They got, people get their feelings hurt for one reason or another, and then that causes more trouble. And these sins that we're talking about here are common sins. Let me just give you some references. You can just write these down, and I'll read them to you. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 29, when it's talking about the sins common amongst those who reject God, it says they are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. So there you got it, envy and strife right, right, right there. In that, that's characteristic of the unbelieving world. It shows up, unfortunately, in the, in the church. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 and verse 20. Here's Paul writing to a church. And uh, he says, For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. And so he's saying, you know, I'm kind of hesitant to come. I need to come and see you. I need to come and, and address these things, but I'm afraid of what I'm going to find when I get there. I don't think that they had this on their website. Come to our church in Corinth. Man, we got the best quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. Come on, you'll fit right in. Yeah. And in uh, Galatians chapter 5, when it's talking about the, the deeds of the flesh, it, it talks about idolatry, sorcery, Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, and divisions. You see, when, my, when I'm acting in my flesh, it's all about me getting what I want. He warns them back in verse 15. Uh, and this is, you know, the, Bible, the New Testament is full of one another's, you know, how we're supposed to love one another, encourage one another, but there are some one another's you don't want to do. Verse 15 is one of them, Galatians 5.15, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. And you've got to understand, these are not throwaway lines. Uh, these are not hypothetical, hey, you, you might see this sometime. No, this is, this is what happens. And in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and, and verse 4, uh, particularly talking about people who are not teaching sound doctrine, it says uh, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions. So see, that's something that happens. That's why you've got to know the Bible, because false teaching, one of the results of it is envy, uh, dissensions, conflicts, quarrels, all of that. Difficult people can affect our stability. I mean, if you're having to deal with people like this, it affects your stability. But I think you'll be helped by not being surprised that this ever happens. You know, we need to expect that there's going to be conflict, even in the church. We can't get distracted from the main thing. Uh, it, we got to advance the gospel. and We have to have a passion for that. And the real key to this is not that the conflict happens. The key is how do you respond to it? And so let's evaluate your response. In verse 18, Paul says, what then? 
only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Um, you know, just a, just a warning to start off with. Don't be surprised by conflict in the church. Don't have unrealistic expectations of the church. I think it was Spurgeon that said, if you find a perfect church, don't join it because you'll mess it up. I mean, this kind of conflict was happening in the church in Rome. It's happening in the church at Philippi. It happens at churches everywhere all the time. It even happens in Huntington Beach. And here's something that I really want you to take seriously. If your feelings get hurt by something or somebody at church, first thing you should ask yourself is, why are my feelings hurt? Why? Is it because uh, of my pride? Is it because of my selfish ambition? Is it because of my envy? Is it because I, I'm really not passionate about the gospel? It's more about me than it is about the gospel? Ask yourself, why are my feelings hurt by this? I think that would be a helpful thing for, for you to think through. Well, why, why exactly is this hurting me so bad? Why are my feelings hurt? And then the, the second thing here is, let, let's look at the example, the example of Paul. I love the, how he starts off verse 18. You know, he ends verse 17 saying, some people are trying to aff afflict me in my imprisonment. Verse 18, he basically says, so what? So, so what? Christ is being proclaimed. That's what matters to me. It doesn't matter what people are saying about me. Christ is being proclaimed, so, so what? And, and a couple of things to take note of here that helps Paul to say that is, uh, you'll notice in verse 16, he says, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Paul was confident that he was right where the Lord wanted him to be. And, and so... All of this stuff isn't going to throw him off course. He, he feels like uh, he is right where he needs to be. He, he, he says, I've been put here. I've been appointed would be another way to translate that. It, it's a military term. Paul is saying, this is my assignment from God. I am where I'm supposed to be, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I am on my assignment. And he's confident of that. So they may be putting him down, trying to make him feel bad because he's in prison. He's saying, no, I am exactly where God wants me to be. And you might want to ask yourself, are you that confident that you were right where God wants you to be, doing right what God wants you to do? And how would you know that? I think a lot of people are looking for the most comfortable situation they could possibly find. Uh, they're not rejoicing because they're in prison and God has opened up a, a, a way for the gospel to get the people that never would have heard it otherwise. They would be thinking about how bad this is for them. They wouldn't be praying for an open door for the gospel. They'd be praying for an open door to the prison. Get me out of here. Uh, Paul was confident, no, this is right where God wants me to be. Um, and, you know, sometimes difficult circumstances and problems with other people are things that we bring on ourselves. I mean, this is Sunday morning at church, we've got to be honest, right? Some of my problems, they're my fault. They're, they're not these other people's fault, they're, they're my fault. They're my fault. Uh, I've made bad choices. I've acted out of ignorance. And maybe I've just acted out of outright disobedience. And that's why I'm having hard times. If I'm going to be stable 
and be able to deal with all the circumstances and people of life, I got to be confident that I am on God's assignment. And one thing I do know is that my assignment is to make disciples. And I got to be passionate about seeing God's program advance no matter what it costs me. So that's, that's the other thing here would be to keep your eyes on what really matters. You know, when you look at this, Paul was everything his opponents weren't. He, he's not going to stoop to their level. He's not, go, he's not going to go there. Uh, but that happens often. People are attacking me. I'm, oh, let me attack you. That, that happens often. Paul's not going to let this distract him. He's going to stay focused on what really matters. And what really matters is not what people are saying about me. What really matters is not the opinions of this group or that group, but that Christ is being proclaimed. That's, that's what matters. Paul submitted all of his own personal interests to those of the bigger picture of making Christ known. That there, you, you'll see absolutely no self-pity with Paul. He, he's just not going not gonna to go there. So here's the question we ask ourselves. Can we keep our eyes on the things that matter the most, or does everything need to go my way? If everything needs to go your way, get ready for a bumpy ride. You're not going to know spiritual stabil stability. Now, this is talking about people inside the church attacking Paul. What about people outside the church? Let me just show you, just give you one example. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. What, what, what about people outside the church that are giving, giving us a hard time? And that might happen. You, you might hear of this happening somewhere sometime. Like from a family member. Or co-workers, or people in your neighborhood giving you a hard time. Well, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, Paul says, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I want to be gentle towards those people. I'm not going to quarrel with them. I'm going to be patient with them. I'm going to try every opportunity I have to tell them the truth because I want them saved. It, it's got to be more than just, I don't want them bugging me anymore. I want them saved. And so I'm not going to quarrel with them. I'm not going to get in fights with them. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to endure evil. I'm going to correct them with gentleness because I want them to come to know Christ. I want them to have repentance. That, that's the attitude. And, you, you know, you need, to, you need to think about that as you deal with those difficult people in your life who might be really in your life, they might be in your same house for some of you. You know, the, the irony of the whole thing there in Philippians 1 is that the efforts of Paul's opponents, they were motivated to hurt Paul, they're out to hurt Paul, but actually they're furthering Paul's interest and his passion in the gospel. You know, they're out to hurt Paul, and Paul's thinking, Man, this, is like, this is so great being here in prison. As long as the gospel was advancing, Paul didn't care who the instrument was. That is a key thing. As long as the gospel is advancing, I don't care who the, who the human instrument is that God uses. It doesn't have to be me. I don't have to get all the glory. I don't have to have everybody saying my name when they get baptized. I don't care. I'm just glad that they're there getting baptized, that they've been saved, and I don't care who the person was that talked to them. Paul, Paul didn't care 
who the instrument was. Uh, he, he was like, he was kind of like Moses in that regard. You guys remember the story from Numbers chapter 11? You guys been doing your devotions in, in Numbers chapter 11 recently? Numbers chapter 11. Uh, well, God has told Moses, hey, I want to help you out. So I'm going to take the spirit that I've put on you and I'm going to divvy it up and I'm going to add 70 more guys to help you do this. Um, you know, which would be a big help to Moses, right? With the people that he's dealing with. And so here's what happens. It's in Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse 24. It says, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. So that was kind of the sign that God had done what he said he was going to do. Verse 26, now two men remained in the camp. Two men who were part of the 70, two men who should have been out there with the others, but they weren't. They were, for whatever reason, they were in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And like that's a bad thing. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Whoa. Whoa. That's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's the right attitude. I don't, I, the more, the better. It doesn't have to be all about me. And of course, there's that famous line just over in chapter 12 of Numbers, verse 3. It says, now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. Yeah, that's what... If we're going to be stable Christians, we need that kind of humility, that kind of meekness. Um, as long as the gospel is advancing, I'm, I'm happy. It doesn't matter what's happening to me. It doesn't matter what people are saying about me. That's not what matters. You know, I think that what we're talking about here is real life. Real life. There's an awful lot of Christians who ride the roller coaster of their feelings. The Lord is calling us to live a stable life by prioritizing His Word, by living for His glory, and sharing His passion. It's got to be about Christ and His gospel, not, not about me. Not about me. And you know, so we've been we've been going at this for four weeks, and uh, you know, you might feel like every week is like a, just another slap in the face here, uh, revealing my instability. But I want you to understand that this isn't something that you know you're expected to go home and crank out in your own energy, your own efforts. It does take effort on our part, but the power has to be a supernatural source. That's what we're going to look at next week. Sorry, ladies. You'll all be at your retreat. Uh, but hopefully you'll come back empowered from your retreat. Probably it'll take us two weeks to uncover all the power. So you'll get in on the, on the afterglow. Uh, two, two weeks. <laughs> two weeks from now. But that is important. You've got to have the priority. You have to have the purpose and the passion. But you absolutely have to have the power. Because you can't do this in your own energy. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Any, uh, any questions, criticisms, commentary? Uh, you want to stir up any conflict? Yes, ma'am. Yes. 
I think uh, feelings, we, we don't want to be dominated by our feelings. That's the problem. We all have feelings. Uh, we're not saying shut down your feelings, but feelings are not uh, the source of our direction. Uh, God and his word has to be what's directing us, and I need to be committed to doing what God and his word says, despite how I might be feeling. So the problem is when it comes right down to it, who wins, God and his word or my feelings? And uh, too often, I'm afraid, feelings win. In fact, like I said, once people, once their emotions kick in, you, you, you can read all the Bible you want to to them. It's not going to make any difference. Yes, sir. Great. You're probably the only one in the whole room, too. But he, he's saying it's applicable to him right now. Uh, the rest of you are wondering who these people are that cause conflict. Uh, but uh, no, it, it is applicable. This is real life. This is where we really live. Uh, so this is, this is, you know, I'm thinking this is practical stuff. Because we need to be stable Christians, living for focused on Lord and His glory, and not not about me. Yeah. Any anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it does apply to every situation. I I think we expect it in the world from unbelievers that they're going to be have conflict with us. I think we expect that. I think the thing that we don't respond to very well is when it happens inside the church. Because how can these things be? I thought I had moved into the sunny side of Hallelujah Street. And, uh, you know, now these people are throwing eggs at my house. How can that be? But uh, that, that's, that, that can be hard to take. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, uh, we got a solid rock. We got a firm foundation. We got everything we need to stand firm and be stable for the Lord. Let's take advantage of what he's given us. All right? Yeah, let's pray. Uh, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it does address real life uh, for all of us. And I, I pray, Lord, that we might uh, grow in our understanding of you and your word that our, our hearts and minds and lives would be focused on you, living for you, advancing your cause, that it would be just like John the Baptist said about Christ, he must increase, I must decrease. Lord, I pray that that might be true for each one of us and, and that we'll experience the joy that comes, as Paul said, from living that kind of a stable spiritual life. So, Father, I pray that you'll help each one of us to work these things through in our own hearts and lives and in our own relationships. And we pray that your name will be honored and your cause will be advanced. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.